This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. We begin today's show with an FSA update from the Kansas Farm Service Agency State Executive Director, Dennis McKinney. He shares friendly reminders on the fast-approaching March 15th deadline for ARC PLC signups, as well as insight on soon-to-be-announced programming for distressed producers during a time when cash flow is tight for many. Also ahead, Jeff Whitworth, K-State field crop entomologist, joins us for a conversation on early season pests. He shares information on how to best control both brown recluse spiders and alfalfa weevils this time of year. We end today's show with this week's Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts, where K-State experts Brad White, Brian Lubers, and Philip Lancaster answer a listener's question on how to best prepare bulls for the breeding season. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. Today, we are joined now by Kansas Farm Service Agency State Executive Director Dennis McKinney for an FSA update. So before we get into things, Dennis, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we've got several things to talk through going on at the FSA, but we wanted to start off with a deadline reminder that is right around the corner. That's right. The ARC PLC sign up. That's the basic program, basic farm program. Sign up is March 15th, and we're 78% signed up right now, so we got some folks out there need to hurry up and get in and get signed up at your FSA office. Folks, please don't wait. Now, I'm from southwest Kansas, so I'll say this. Southwest Kansas is probably lagging the furthest behind, so producers, get in there and, and get signed up. Absolutely. The sooner the better. That deadline is right around the corner. It's so. right around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> A great reminder for sure. And then you also wanted to remind listeners that PARP and ERP Phase 2 signups are ongoing, and that's going on through May, right? That's correct. And, you know, these are revenue-based programs. We'll see, I think, more shifts to revenue-based programs where we actually look at did an event hurt the producer's revenue, lets us target limited funds to those who need it the most. So I think we'll see that more of a shift revenue programs. We'll see more cooperation with RMAs so we can share crop insurance data and kind of streamline the process. So I think that's where we're headed. Typically, for most Kansas producers, 2020 and 2021 were better years in 18, 2018 and 19. We had drought in 18, didn't raise very good wheat crop. But for some, there was a decline between 2018 or 19 and 2020, particularly those like some purebred breeding operations. Some of those qualify because PARP does recognize losses in livestock. So take a look at it on farmers.gov. There's a worksheet you can use to take a look at it. Uh, if you have your accountant help you when you compute what's qualified gross revenue to compare among the years, if you have them help you, they'll probably have you wait until after April 15th until they're past tax season. But those worksheets are there on farmers.gov for both the producers, for both the pandemic assistance revenue program and ERP2. So take a look at that. There's a few of our producers will qualify, but not a lot, but there are some who will and should take a look at it. Yeah, a great resource to check out, especially with those uh, worksheets, like you mentioned, super helpful tool, easy enough to put in information and see what turns out. Right. Wonderful. And then I know general CRP signed up is also now underway. So a great reminder for those interested in signing up for that program. Through April the 7th, uh, the national office tells us they've set up extra servers, so it'll be easier to enter the data. As in the past, there's been times our office has tried to enter the data and had to wait a few hours because it, the servers were busy. But they put it, set up extra servers. You'll see an improved erodibility index. Last year, they had software issues. We were shut off for about eight, day, eight days and had to cram a whole bunch of work through in the last few days. This year, you're actually going to see that erodibility index print out on your application when you sign up. So you actually understand why and how that payment rate was calculated. And it'll show the different soil types and what the payment rate was on those different soil types. So that actually gives us a lot better information in this sign-up, in the CRP sign-up number 60. Conservation Reserve Program is probably the, the largest acres and a dollars conservation program in the history of USDA one of the most successful when it comes to conserving resources and creating better wildlife habitat. More flexibility now than there used to be. You have a certain number of days you can graze either every other year, every third year, and the producer now gets to choose the days. Whether you want to graze early in the year or late in the year, you can choose the days. So that lets us meet the needs to handle invasive species or develop the grasses as we want to develop them. So we're no longer locked into that July 15th through September time frame on our grazing. Producer gets a lot more flexibility to do what is actually better for the grass and for wildlife habitat. Yeah, and for their own production system. So that's, that's wonderful. Right. That's right. 
Great. So that's a great program to sign up for. Again, the general CRP sign up is now underway through April. And you also wanted to discuss today some farm loan changes that are going on with the FSA. Just some benefits for those that are looking to apply in the process, right? That's right. The working, shortening up the application process, taking a number of pages off that application. Uh, I can remember a long time ago when it was still Farmers Home Administration, and I was getting started. I went in and looked at that, and I thought, oh, my. <laughs> I've got a good banker. I'll just work with him. <laughs> but shorter application process, uh, we still have the beginning farmer loan program. We have youth loans in some parts of the state. The youth loans are very popular. So we're trying to make a, a stronger effort this year to make 4-H leaders and those VOAG instructors across the state aware of what our youth loans have so we can help get young people started earlier building a herd or getting that farming operation started. But we have several changes there. We also have, under the Inflation Reduction Act, a program that will help some producers who are distressed and are struggling. We're seeing that more now, obviously, than we were last year or the year before because cash flows are pretty darn tight. Uh, I know that from personal experience. And so we've got that program. We don't have all of our guidelines on it yet. We hope to get the guidelines on that sometime in the next 10 days to two weeks. There will be some cash flow analysis required to see if a borrower qualifies for that assistance of a one-time assistance with your next payment or the payment you've just missed. But that will be there to help some of our producers who are distressed at this current time. Absolutely. A great resource, especially like you said, with everything that's gone on in the past year or so, a time like this is when we need programs like that most. So, Right. We're also There's also a shift going on for some categories of borrowers to look more at financial ratios instead of cash flow. Cash flow statements, of course, take a lot of time for a producer to work up. And then all of a sudden, two months later, fertilizer doubles or interest rates go up or you just decide, hey, now's the time to expand my livestock operation or to do something different. And so, you know, in agriculture, we're constantly bobbing and weaving and, and, and adapting to the situations that are presented to us, which makes, in my view, from my personal experience, makes analysis of those ratios maybe a, give you a better picture of what the capabilities of that producer versus cash flow, because we're constantly adapting to the conditions at hand. Things change pretty rapidly sometimes in agriculture. Especially nowadays. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's wonderful to keep in mind all of those farm loan changes and updates still to come. And I know you wanted to end with some updates on the drought monitor. Obviously, things are somewhat improving for parts of the state, but not so much in other regions. We're still gripped by it in southwest and western Kansas, but and along the southern border, all along those that southern line of counties, clear out in the southeast Kansas. Backed off maybe a little bit off Cherokee and Labette County, but still a long line of, of severe and exceptional drought out there. We've missed, in you know my part of the state, we've missed most of the good snows that have come along. We've had some good snows. You know what we look for this time of year for wheat farmers like me, wheat's a tough crop. If we can just get enough moisture to buy us some time, get us through, and then get some good filling weather, we know we still have good crop potential out there if we can get good filling weather in April and May. So hopefully we can still get that. Kansas is still more affected by drought than any other state that I've seen. If you look at that national drought monitor, which is one reason I tell producers, hey, when you certify your crop acres, go ahead and certify your grass acres at the same time. If we trigger for drought payments, it'll make it a whole lot easier for our folks at the FSA office. But again, at the Farm Service Agency, as I've said before, we have the privilege of partnering with the world's best farmers and ranchers. We get to help conserve natural resources. When it comes to the word sustainability, hey, we were the first. We were doing sustainability before the word sustainability was around. We also get to partner with the world's best farmers and ranchers to create the safest, most abundant food supply in the world, and we're proud of that. Dennis, thanks so much for joining us today. I appreciate you joining us and speaking with us about some of the programs going on at the FSA. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Once again, everyone, that was State Executive Director for the Kansas Farm Service Agency, Dennis McKinney, joining us for some FSA updates. Before we cut to a short break, a quick word on a new form of audio content for all you listeners to enjoy. It's coming from Mary Marsh with the Kansas Wheat Commission. Just in time for spring field work season in the tractor, Kansas Wheat is proud to announce the launch of the newest broadcast in town, the Wheat's On Your Mind podcast. Hosted by Aaron Harris, Kansas Wheat Vice President of Research and Operations, the bi-weekly podcast will discuss wheat research projects, the latest in domestic and global wheat markets, policy news like tracking the coming farm bill, wheat crop conditions, management decisions, and more. Wheat's On Your Mind is meant to be both educational and entertaining, showcases the stories and people in the wheat world, Harris said. We're excited for the wide array of audiences it will reach from millers to consumers and everyone in between. Harry's kicked off the first episode with a two-part discussion with Romulo Lulato, a wheat production specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Lulato is well-known voice in the Kansas wheat industry, sharing the latest in his ongoing research into wheat management strategies. 
He currently oversees 20 different research projects related to wheat production or applied wheat physiology. If you've been to a wheat meeting in Kansas, you'll definitely recognize Romulo's voice, Harry said. We sit down to chat with Romulo growing up in Brazil, how his passion for extension work really took hold, and how he ended up at Oklahoma State University and what eventually brought him here to K-State. Part one of the podcast focuses less on Lulato's agronomic expertise and more on giving listeners a deeper glimpse into where he grew up in Brazil and how his father's work and research shaped his views on disseminating research directly to farmers who can put that research into practice. We have research institutions that do research and my dad was in one of those, Lulato shared. By his nature, he was an extension guy and he was just telling things in a way that was fun for growers to learn. But he was an outlier in that sense that he was doing a lot more extension than he was getting credit for. Because in Brazil, that was done by a completely separate person than the one doing the research. Following part two of Harry's chat with Lulato will be a conversation with Raleigh Sears, retired K-State and AgriPro wheat breeder and current president of Prairie View Genetics. The pair will be discussing development of Jagger, one of the most widely planted and best parent varieties of hard red winter wheat. Sears made the initial cross for Jagger at K-State and has tracked the variety's pedigree into popular varieties planted today, including Everest, Joe, and Tatanka. Tune in to learn more about how this Jagger came to be and the importance of investing grower dollars into wheat breeding programs. Kansas Wheat will be promoting individual episodes on the organization's social media channels, but listeners should subscribe so they don't miss any of the excitement. Listeners can tune in wherever they listen to podcasts, including Apple or Spotify. Or check out the podcast website at wheatsonyourmind.com. With Can Sweet, this is Mary Marsh. Once again, we're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. Today, we are joined now by K-State field crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth for a conversation on some pests you should be mindful of as we head into spring here. So, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you for asking me, Samantha. Absolutely. So you've been getting some questions about brown recluses. March is usually the time they show up, right? Exactly. And it seems a little early, but you know what? It is March, so they're here. Just to refresh everybody, the brown recluse spider kind of goes dormant between October and March every year. So between March and October, in the the warm of the seasons, they're very active, and they're out searching for food because they are seekers. They don't build nice, elaborate webs as the uh, black widow does, but the brown recluse is out actively seeking food. So a lot of times they've been in dormancy since October. They are come out of dormancy. They're relatively hungry, yet there aren't too many Uh, food sources around, not too many other insects. So they're very active and people run into them. Also, just a caution to all the growers out there, the old storage buildings you use, garages, and those are great sites for brown recluse spiders. Any place you have um, cardboard or boxes or insulation or anything like that stored, you're going to have a bunch of brown recluse spiders. When we go to collect brown recluses, that's the kind of place we look for. So just be careful when you're cleaning it out in the spring or if you're moving around in the spring to get equipment out. The brown recluses are becoming active. The thing about a brown recluse, the questions I get, how do you control them, especially early on because a lot of folks would like to control them now before they produce eggs and before they produce young. The number one key to controlling brown recluse spiders is, as I just said, clean out all of your storage facilities. Um, (laughs) I know it sounds easy. It's not easy to do, but that's the best thing. Get rid of all old carpeting, anything like that that can harbor insects will harbor brown recluse spiders. A lot of times you don't even realize how many are there because, as the name implies, they are reclusive. They're really good at hiding, uh, especially all winter. They've just kind of been uh, in cracks and crevices and wrapped up in little balls of webbing, and so they really go unnoticed, but then now they're starting to come out. As far as insecticides go, you know, an application of an insecticide will kill a brown recluse spider if it gets right on the spider or if the spider gets into it while it is still damp. We've done some research over the years looking at different insecticides, different ways of spraying insecticides or different applications, whether it's a dry insecticide or, you know, a liquid insecticide. 
I hate to say they don't work, but they don't work well enough that we recommend that. And the other way of controlling them, which is a pretty good way, is to use sticky traps. If you go um, get a sticky trap and put those in under beds and dark out-of-the-way places, you'll do a really pretty good job of collecting brown recluse spiders and other insects. But as far as spraying goes, that's really tough to control. The best thing to do is clean out it, get rid of all the clutter, put sticky traps around. If you want to spray, uh, you can spray and it will kill the other insects, which is a food source for the brown recluse. So eventually, as the food source dwindles, as if you spray it two or three times, you are going to reduce the amount of brown recluse population. And if you use sticky traps, the two of those together is probably the best way of reducing brown recluse populations. One caution, if you do use sticky traps to catch brown recluses, be very careful when you pick those up because the legs are very brittle. They break quite easily. And if the spider's just stuck to the sticky trap by one or two legs and the leg breaks off, the spider's going to drop on your hand or in your lap or something, and they can still bite. So just when you handle sticky traps, be careful. Remember, they can stay alive on a sticky trap for two or three days or even up to a week. So when you get ready to remove them, just be cognizant that they can still be alive and they can still bite. The other question we get a lot of early on is, are the small brown recluses, are they venomous also? Yes, they are. All spiders are venomous. It's just the brown recluse and the black widow have the kind of toxin that is a little more hazardous to humans. But all spiders are venomous. That's how they capture and kill their prey. Sometimes you might be a little more allergic to a wolf spider venom or, you know, a tarantula venom. And so it's kind of like a um, bee sting. You know, I can get stung by a bee and it hurts. Somebody else can get stung and they swell up. So you have individual reactions to the different venoms. So we always caution everybody, just don't mess with spiders. So just leave them alone, get rid of the clutter, and they will leave you alone because, as the name implies, they're reclusive. But they are coming out. And for the next oh, two or three weeks, you're going to see more and more of them as they search for that first food source after their um, six months fasting period. Great reminders on those creepy crawlies popping up around this time of year. And I know another pest that people might be thinking of right now might be alfalfa weevils. It's about that time where we're expecting things to warm up, and that means that these critters are kind of the first to pop up. Yes, that's exactly right. You know, it's early on. The alfalfa weevil is one of the first pests to show up in alfalfa. Now, there's some pea aphids already there, but they don't develop enough to cause problems this early. And a lot of the alfalfa is still in uh, dormant, so they're not going to cause a problem anyway. But the questions I get this time of year before the alfalfa weevils get really active is alternatives to chemical pest control for alfalfa weevil. And just recently I've had some calls about flaming or burning alfalfa for controlling alfalfa weevils. You know what? It's a good idea. It's a really good thought. Uh, the first time I heard it, I thought that was really innovative. And so we put together some tests, oh, 10 or 12 years ago, where we built some flamers and we did some flaming of alfalfa or some burning of alfalfa. It's kind of neat because you can do it now. And you know what? If it helps your particular field get rid of weeds or get rid of maybe excess residue that's dried and allows, you know, the alfalfa to germinate a little better, I say do it, you know, go for it. As far as alfalfa weevil control, it doesn't work that well consistently. What you're trying to do is kill the eggs. The eggs are in the stems, whether the stems are laying on the ground or they're are vertically still standing. When you burn that, you're trying to kill those eggs inside before they hatch into larvae. And it doesn't work really well. I mean, we had a couple of fields that it reduced populations considerably, but still by the time late April or May comes, the alfalfa weevil adults have moved around. They've moved back into those fields, and they've laid eggs, so you still had to treat again. So that's what I say. If it fits into your program and it works pretty well, you're going to get some side benefits like maybe weed control and get rid of some of the residue. But as far as just alfalfa weevil control, I, it doesn't work consistently well enough that we recommend it. Like I said, if you want to try it, try it. can't hurt anything. Uh, and I thought it was a neat idea. It just... It hasn't worked well enough that we recommend it. A couple of the other ways that people have thought of as alternatives to chemical insecticides are grazing, and that works also 
somewhat or disking where you go out and disk the field and try and disk the eggs under. They all work, and if, if it fits into your program, I say go for it. But as far as alfalfa, we will control per se. It just doesn't work consistently well enough that we recommend it. It's still back to the old chemical insecticide treatment. Now, relative to that, if you're following the mesonet, there's a program on the mesonet. We developed a program five or six years ago where you can plug into the alfalfa weevil in the closest uh, weather station to your location, and it will tell you how many thermal units or growing degree days have accumulated since January 1st. And for alfalfa weevils, it takes about 300 growing degree days or thermal units for the eggs to hatch. So once the eggs hatch, then the larvae are out there feeding 24-7. So that's mainly what we're working for. Now, one of the caveats with that, I said January 1st is when we start the program. A lot of the eggs are laid in November and December, and anytime the temperature's above 48 degrees, they're accumulating thermal units or the growing degree days are accumulating. So that's why on our recommendation we say, Based upon that, once you get 160 to 200 growing degree days or thermal units, you probably want to get out in your alfalfa and start looking, but only if it's broken dormancy. Because until it breaks dormancy, the alfalfa weevil has to have live plant material to feed on. It'll feed on dormant plant material or dead plant material for a day or two, but they can't sustain themselves on that. So uh, if alfalfa has not broken dormancy, it doesn't really matter what stage of growth um, alfalfa we was in yet, but uh, I've been in several fields, and it looks to me like it's getting close to starting to come back in the spring. So uh, just keep that in mind. Once you get the 160 to 200 growing degree days starting from January 1st and the alfalfa is starting to green up, I would recommend you get out and start looking with two other caveats. Number one, I've gotten calls about birds out in alfalfa fields. If the birds are feeding in alfalfa, they're not feeding on alfalfa weevils. They're probably feeding on army cutworms or some little worm out there. Alfalfa weevil eggs are in the stems, so the birds aren't feeding on that yet. But if you see a flock of blackbirds or other birds out in the field, I'd certainly go out and look and see what they are feeding on. So keep that in mind. And once you get out there, once the alfalfa is broken dormancy, don't be too quick to spray. Our treatment threshold or economic injury level is a third to 50% infested. So if you have one out of three plants or one out of two plants infested, that might be a good time to spray. Wonderful. Well, some great early season pest reminders for producers tuning in. Jeff, can't thank you enough for all the information you've shared today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much, Samantha. Absolutely. And I'll be linking to that Mesonet tool as well for those of you interested in utilizing that as a resource. So be sure to find that in the show notes of today's show, which can be found on agtoday.net as always. But once again, everyone, that was K-State field crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth joining us for a conversation on early season pests. We'll be back with more ahead on agriculture today. You are tuned back into Agriculture Today, and we're ending today's show with this week's BCI's Ask the Experts. This week, we're joined by K-State experts Brad White, Brian Lubers, and Philip Lancaster. Hi, welcome to BCI Ask the Experts. I'm Brad White, joined today by Dr. Brian Lubers. Good morning, Brad. And Dr. Philip Lancaster. Hi, Brad. We're happy to have you with us on this show. Our experts will answer your questions, and we're happy if you send us questions to put those on the list for future episodes. You can email us at bci at ksu.edu. And today's listener question was, what should I do to get my bulls ready for the breeding season? Philip, I'm going to turn to you first. One of the first things is make sure that they have good nutrition leading up to the breeding season. That bull needs to be probably in body condition score six or so going into the breeding season because he's going to lose weight during the breeding season or he should lose weight during the breeding season because he should be focused on breeding cows more than he is on eating so he's probably going to lose a couple hundred pounds during the breeding season and so i want to make sure that he is in a little bit above average body condition score so he's got the reserves to lose without losing a whole lot of muscle mass absolutely so good body condition philip starts out with a six brian what do you say i'm gonna say the First thing I want to do as we get ready for breeding season is I want a complete and thorough breeding soundness exam. 
which actually includes body condition score as well. But I want to make sure that got good feet underneath him. I want to make sure that he doesn't have any eye problems so he can see the cow. So he's got to walk to the cows. He's got to see the cows and then a complete semen evaluation to make sure that his motility is good, make sure his sperm morphology is good because when he gets there, he has to actually be able to breed the cows. So I'm going to say a complete and thorough breeding soundness exam. Absolutely. So including everything Philip talked about and adding to it that he has to be able to pass that. So Philip, I'm going to ask you, and Brian starts out with eight, but I'm going to ask you, Philip, when do I do this assessment of body score relative to breeding season? And I'll give you a specific date. So my breeding season is going to start May 15. When should I start assessing the body score on the bull? A month ago. Okay. Because I want, I want a good two, three months to get him in condition. If he's not in the appropriate condition currently, then I need some time to put weight on him. I don't want to feed him, you know, like a grower diet or a feedlot diet to try to put weight on him in a short period of time. I want to do it slowly over time with an energy supplement to his normal hay feeding. And so I want to assess that two, three months ahead of time. Okay. So what rate do you want him to gain? Well, it depends on how much he needs to gain, but let's say he's at a five and I need him to go up to a six, that's about a hundred pounds. So on 90 days, that means I need to get him to gain about a pound a day. So you don't want it, just like you said, you don't want him growing too fast, Mm -hmm. but you do want him to gain weight as he's going in and be in a positive energy balance. Yes. breeding season. So Brian, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you the same question, except about the BSE. How close to the start of breeding season do I want to do that BSE? Well, fortunately, my answer is about the same as Philip. So 60 to 90 days, I think, is a good window. And essentially for the same reason, just the health aspects, if there are problems, then I have time to potentially correct those before the breeding season comes around. So that could be, you know, if he's got a case of foot rot, he would not pass a breeding soundness exam. I've got time to treat him, get him better, and then make him to where he could pass it. Um, If he has issues with his semen motility, morphology, we would want to do a recheck in another 30 days to see if it's changed. And if it's improved, then great. He passes his breeding soundness exam. He's good to go. If it's not improved, then we need to make decisions. And we still have time. If the decision is I need another bull, I still have time potentially to go find me another bull. So I'm ready for that breeding season once it hits. So I think that two to three month window is perfect time. Absolutely. So Philip has gained a couple points. He's up to eight. Brian, you stayed at eight because you copied off your neighbor with the time frame. But this is your last question. And really just a kind of a yes or no. I've got multiple bulls going into the same pasture. Would I introduce them prior to going in the breeding pasture, or would you introduce them in the breeding pasture? You mean introduce them to each to other? To each other, yes. Sorry. Uh, I think I'd do it before they go into the pasture with the cows because they're going to have to establish a pecking order, and I don't want them doing that while they're supposed to be breeding cows. I want them to have that pecking order kind of established so that when they get in there with the cows, they're chasing cows, not fighting each other. Absolutely. So Philip gets one point for that and Brian doesn't get a chance to answer, which is a frustrating way to lose. But you guys had a lot of good information today. So thanks for sharing with us. And as always, if you have questions, you can send them in to PCI at KSU.edu. Once again, those were K-State experts Brad White, Brian Lubers, and Philip Lancaster rounding out today's show. We'll be back with more tomorrow on Agriculture Today.